The one that I've seen where it doesn't work very well is you've got a central hub of centers of excellence uh, that say what the standards are, and then you delegate the execution of those standards to the local business unit that then interpret them in their own means. That's really more for business strategy, I'd say, not for something, definitely not for finance. You don't let functions determine, you know, what is under gap accounting standards. We're like, no, uh, Central runs that. And, you know, scheduling is, scheduling is one of these things where it depends really what you're doing, where you can draw that line. So, I'll yeah, go. Scotty, Scotty Pippen, give it the ball to Jordan. We got this. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Micah Pipo, and I'm a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. And my name's Greg Lawton. I'm the CEO of an AI schedule management company called Nodes and Links. On today's episode, we are going to dive into program and portfolio analysis. Greg and I have been thinking about and discussing this topic greatly, and we're going to have a meandering conversation wherever we want to go on this topic. So Greg, how about you start off by giving me the PMI definition for program <laughs> and portfolio analysis? <laughs> is a program a collection of projects or is a portfolio a collection of projects? Does a portfolio align to the business? I'm just kidding. We're not going there, folks. Why don't you kick <laughs> us off and talk about what's on the top of your mind? Right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with two things. Number one, genuinely for the people listening, okay, what's the difference between a project program and portfolio? The actual definitions are in the PMI or the APM documentation. But essentially, a program is a collection of projects that have interdependencies between them. A portfolio is a range of projects that may or may not have interconnections between them. And obviously, you know, you can have programs in portfolios or you cannot. If all of your projects are not related, you'll have a lot of project, but no, no programs, blah, blah, blah. So those are just some definitions. Um, the thing That's something we're going to need to dive into, because when you say not related, immediately my brain goes to, if you are out there constructing facilities, buildings, they, at a certain point on the operation side, are all related. What sort of processes mm -hmm. you bring to the table is going to be very related. We'll dive into that later because I think that's going to immediately get into the weeds. So bring us back up. I'll, I'll bring it back. So um, specifically the conversation, I've been, I've been talking with a lot of SVPs of project controls, project management, scheduling, CTOs, that kind of thing. So I, I'm going to anchor this conversation on what it, what it is that planning and scheduling leaders do at that level of an organization and what they care about on a day-to-day -day basis. And the thing they do revolves around four themes. It's people, processes, systematization, and tools. And ultimately, these senior people are responsible for making sure that proper planning, scheduling, cost management gets done. To do that, you need to hire the, and train the right people. You need to have the right governance processes in, in place. The systematization is the automation of governance processes with respect to the people. So it's having governance processes in there that you can't get around. And a perfect example is requesting time off for holiday. Yes, you can just not turn up to work, but to do it, yeah, you know, you don't want to do that. You, you have to go into some kind of system and request a holiday and then someone approves. So that's systematization. And then um, the, the fourth is tools. So tools are essentially the productivity enhancing technologies that you equip the people with to do the processes etc and i think what's really interesting at this level and i'll stop here is that the, the conversation i've been having splits into two folds one is the fundamental elements of those so what are the standards the processes the governance reports the notifications the tool sets these kinds of things and then the second is okay now I've got all that in place, what am I, analytics do I need to pull? You know, a, a super simple one that I, a super simple one is things like, are all my schedules built using the same coding structure? If you think about this, if you're sitting in a head office somewhere in the world and you've got 200 people around the world doing that, 
except for phoning up all 200 people every single month and seeing their schedule and checking it yourself, how do you actually make sure that one, people are using your coding structures, and two, that ones that aren't are being flagged to you? And I think that gets into a, a very interesting conversation. Finally. Finally, Greg has talked about something that I'm actually salivating over and deal with on a regular basis. And I know anyone who's scheduled more than one project or overseen more than one project has faced the same you know, sort of issues on the coding. But I think coding is just an example of literally just about everything that's going to happen when you start expanding to that program and portfolio level. I would like to focus more on the portfolio level where, and I hope I don't get the definitions already wrong, those are the projects that seemingly don't have any direct connections. Did I get that right? Not, not quite. What I'm saying or is, is, or is, is one the of these tangential. Is the, or is a the program, program is a collection a, of interconnected projects. Yes. But a portfolio so that's like a large. Just a, yes. I it, want to focus yeah, on the portfolio. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, a, por a portfolio can either be a bunch of programs or it can be a bunch of projects. A portfolio is just a massive group of projects. They could be yes. related or not related. Yeah. You're, you're the CEO of a billion dollar organization. It's just all right. the projects you're doing right now. Yeah. Well, Cause where I'm going with this is like, okay, you're building this like massive facility and it has all these sub projects are in it and they're mm -hmm. all connected together and tied together. Right. Yeah. I think that's one thing. And I think we've talked about that before you can go check out yeah. the other episodes. What I want to get into is, you know, you have 30, 40, 50 projects around the globe that are all, you know, you're not actually relying on the supply chain for one to deliver the other. They're not all interactually yep. connected. That's, that's where I would like to focus this on because to me, that's where the coding issue is actually, and these issues we're talking about are actually harder because you're dealing with a wide group of different people and you have mm -hmm. less control over what's actually happening. And why that happens is because you can sit there and be like, well, Mike, if you wrote your specification and did this and did that and you contractually mandated it, but anyone who's lived in the real world long enough knows that you can write whatever you want, but then you actually have to have people physically checking every single yep. one of those codes if those codes are integral part. And that goes for anything. When I think about that portfolio, I immediately go to how are you structuring your planning and scheduling organization to begin with? Because you have two options here. And there's obviously, you know, variations in between. Option one, you have a very strong, large central team, the, the hub, mm -hmm. if you will. And then you have smaller satellite teams, or you have strong satellite teams and a smaller central team. And those I've seen both deployed, but I think how you think about strategically setting up that organization is going to then trickle down into how you execute those requirements like coding and all those other things. Yeah, I, I think I've I've seen those two and everything in between, and and the most common one, this this what I'm about to explain is a structure that actually exists in both of those extremes. What you have is your corporate. Well, yeah, I'm going to explain it, and then there's a second structure. You've got your let's say your SVP of project management or project controls, and then what you have are VPs. So you'll have maybe a geographic segmentation. So you've got North America, Europe, Asia, whatever, or you've got an industry segmentation. So oil and gas, manufacturing, uh, energy, that kind of thing. And that SVP can make it the account, the accountability or the responsibility of those managers to do. And then the SVP can hold centers of excellence. The one that I've seen where it doesn't work very well is you've got a central hub of centers of excellence uh, that say what the standards are, and then you delegate the execution of those standards to the local business units that then interpret them in their own means. That's really more for business strategy, I'd say, not for something, definitely not for finance. You don't let functions determine you know, what is under gap accounting standards? We're like, no, uh, Central runs that. And, you know, scheduling is one of these things where it depends really what you're doing, where you can draw that line. The other thing I'd like to mention as well is why all this matters when you get to the top. And I don't think that many people actually know the business model of portfolios. You know, the question is, why do large companies exist in project management? Why is it not just a group of small projects? Now, you might say, you might say, well, 
I can take, it's the economies of scale. I can take resources when one project finishes and put it to the other. And you're correct. That, that, that is an advantage. But the, the big reason that um, central treasuries or central portfolios exist, let's say in construction land, is because they can insure projects. So when you're, del when you're bidding, I'm talking contractors here, but when you're bidding for a whole host of work with some very senior clients, they will require underwriting of some form or the what's known as surety arrangements. And surety arrangements are financial guarantees that the company provides via a third party, normally a independent surety or an insurance provider like Lords of London, that will um, underwrite performance. So if the company takes the cash and just walks away and goes nothing, the surety provider actually compensates back the client and then the surety provider sues the contractor and goes after their bank accounts and things. Um, when you have a large portfolio of projects, you can essentially insure those projects across the pack with a head office cost. And it's the law of averages. So you might have 50 projects. You expect 49 to go well and one to go wrong. You don't know which one it is. So you just charge uh, the, four, the all 50 a premium and it kind of pans out. Um, if you think about it that way, an insurance provider is all about minimizing risk whilst maximizing upside, which is not spending the um, the money. This is why at the portfolio level, standards are so important. Because if you don't have standards across the organization, there isn't a solid floor to stand on for you modeling insurance. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people don't actually understand that that's actually the big driver of these things. Because to your point, like you could say, well, the standards for something in the Midwest are different than the standards in Europe. Yeah, but there's still, there's still a concrete floor that you can't go below. If you're trying to do a billion dollar project and you've got no schedule, I'd probably say that that's a, you're probably below the standard there. And I'd say that that's a massive flag for the insurance. If we were uh, doing advertisements, we should just roll to like Jake from State Farm ad. The people in America will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't you have some like gecko or something like that over there? <laughs> yeah, we got a lot. Of, we got get your, you know, uh, get your insurance, folks. Well, let's get a little tactical here and yeah. and go into a little bit more on the portfolio program side. Take that coding example and maybe kind of get into the weeds a bit on different sorts of uh sort of tactics right so yep. what i guess would you think or what would you put at the uh like the 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 have to haves on portfolio management when you're looking specifically at requirements right like and let's just focus it on schedule you know and let's just kind of walk through what are some of those and brainstorm what some of those are okay so um in my mind there's five or six of these I'm I'm just going to spit them off the head. I'll probably forget. Sorry, view, sorry, listeners. I'll probably forget some of them. I'm here. Number to help one, you, out. you have to have an approvals process. You when can't you say just, approvals, what do you mean? I, I what I mean by that is that has like to be this a, project's going to be like twelve months. Do you approve it, and then all the other sorts of things like it? Yes. I, what I mean is a scheduler can't just create a schedule and then give it to a client, and that's the contract. There has to be an approvals process that goes. You know, senior schedules, project management, commercial, finance, all of these, and everyone has to sign off. And it's essentially all the leads that are responsible for all of the resources that are either underpinning or that. Now, you might think, that you know, how's that tactical? It's tactical because scheduling has to lead that. It's, you know, if you create a schedule, you can't just create a schedule and there it goes. You have to socialize it. So that's number one. Number two, to you, something you've mentioned, coding. Now, coding, we can have an argument at what level, but most organizations, they have their top 10 milestones that is in every pro project start, project finish, are two of them. They have to yeah. have them in there because that is what's reported to the board. Because you'll have all My of favorite. these projects. Shell and they go, when weather tight. Yeah. Now, there you go. is the shell weather tight with cardboard doors on or real doors? Let the regional team decide back there. But anyway, so, so milestones. Okay, yeah, you, you, have, you, have your, you have your coding on that. Now, you can, as 
people really understand AI and they really understand the benchmarking and the, the forecasting potential, people are now driving that down to much lower levels, so like level twos or level threes I've seen. Um, My question on that is, will the the technology, has it surpassed or will it surpass standardization? For the last five years, I've been sh you know shoving down my throat. Oh, you have to have clean data. You have to have organized data. You have to have it coded. You have to have it match your design bid package and your this package and that. Have, are we going to cross a point where we don't necessarily have to have it so standardized? Yeah. Just so, so I can't give an exact explanation, but from what I've seen, like the algorithms we use can quite easily read and like understand uh, actual words and combinations of words and and they can understand link complex linkages within data that actually give mach the machine a context that's not to say that if you're creating data which literally doesn't reflect reality so it's like i thought we were building a chip fab and you've put launch rocket it's just literally <laughs> west of it's just a different then How do you think confused. the chips are going to be delivered on the <laughs> yeah. rocket? Okay. Well, I, don't want, I want to stay on the portfolio thing. I don't want to take us on too many tangents because that's where my brain okay. goes. Well, okay. You have the activity, activity coding, activity standards, I would well, say. That's so we've important. Got, we've got approvals processes. We've got standards. Mm -hmm. What you also have, change processes. Mm -hmm. and change management is definitely a, a corporate initiative. The same as... Um, uh, delay analysis and when you, i'm talking here when you're getting into forensics and it could be legal of some kind it'll have guidance documents yeah. on those um you'll also have reporting standards and these you'll have internal you'll have probably varying reported standards for clients but you'll have consistent internal reporting standards you know, the board will need the least amount of information and the business unit will be in need a bit more and then the product, but it will be somewhat consistent in um, a pyramid. You'll also have generally lessons learned processes at the end of a project and close down processes. And yeah, that, that's that spreadsheet that just has like the a thousand yeah. random things that went project picks up and it's like, yeah, I'm hey, not by the way, that did, been you, done did you well. read the lessons learned document? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not saying they've been done well, but if you think, like, if I just top low, like, when you create the program, you create a schedule, it has to have some code, you have to get it signed up. Cool. You have to report on it and you have to do your monthly cycle. Okay, that'll have it. When things change, you need to understand that. When things are delayed, you need to understand that. And then at the end, you need to close down in a specific way and companies have their own lessons learned one. That's the least developed, generally, in my sense. That, in my experience, is kind of the box of this portfolio, but then at the portfolio level, you will have management intervention. So at any point, you'll have like, how many projects are we doing? How many of them are in the red? How many of them are in amber? How many are in green? Therefore, what's our risk profile and what's our exposure, this kind of stuff. So one element is the processes. The other is the analytics. The analytics to me is, is a very interesting conversation because... I think there's a framework that I'm thinking about on portfolios that that mentally I've been shifting to over the last couple of years that I don't see necessarily in the industry, in the writing, in, in quite a few things where I am now looking at the portfolio strictly in terms of how can I make this easier for the next person to come? And mm -hmm. when you look at maybe like that lessons learned document, what would be actually something that's easy for someone to pick up and do? Lessons learned are a piece of knowledge that are tied to a specific context. So, uh, hey, by the way, we screwed up ordering steel because we didn't know that the steel roll dates happened on a certain cadence, right? And so we waited too long and we missed that cadence. So that's the context of it. But that's only relevant at a certain point in time. You know, and so if I was going to make it easier for the next person to come along, I would want to serve that information up to them when it's most necessary and most relevant. So beautiful question. Beautiful. For question. example, you know, like it, it would it would be you know, as we're going through the we're laying out the procurement things. This is when it's actually being served to me. And it's not. And then and then it kind of gets into varying degrees of like how much help you're giving 
help could be, is it a reminder? Is it a, you should, you know, definitely do this or you have to do this type of deal. And that's where to me, portfolio analysis, like take that framework for the full thing. And I just don't, I just don't see it. You know, I don't see people attacking it from that angle either. Well, well, let's, let's actually start. So that's what I call a level three position, like in maturity, a level one maturity position is I actually can just enforce standards. A level zero is I have standards, but who knows who's following them um, and processes. Level one is I can actually check, like I can actually see who's following them. Level two is I can kind of pull all of that together and understand where the portfolio is at. You know, uh, 50% of my projects lay. Okay, well, I, I know that kind of stuff. And then a level three is I can start to take one project and make the next project better for me at a portfolio level. Now, what you've there's a lot of ways of doing that, but uh, what I've seen is um, new roles being, well, it's not really new, it's, it's been developed over 20 years. It's um, uh, uh, learning, learning management. I, for, I forget their exact name. But Make sure, like, Greg, that you, you share all the learnings, all those learnings. Yeah. Well, it's, it's people who, so let me put it in, let me actually put it in context. Oh, let me God. just outright say what I can see is doable right today. So the problem of sharing lessons learned is twofold, uh, threefold. One, capturing them in the first place. Number two is um, understanding their context so you know when to serve it up. And number three yeah. is being in the location when the person needs that knowledge. Now, this is yeah. for what I'd call contextual knowledge. For systemic knowledge, that has to get its way into a process of some kind. So uh, if the knowledge is so critical that it applies to every single project, the way you execute that is you amend processes to include it. This is normally yeah, I mean, where you, you, big you sign up bumpers. In. You put yeah. up bumpers so people can't go. They just physically cannot go outside the bumper. Uh, uh, unless, yeah, and I'll give you an. You I'll know. give you an example. Let's say you've, you're running a financial system, and you only have one approval for a million of spend, and someone runs off with a million dollars. You'll go. Maybe it's a bad idea to have one approval. Now we have two. You don't stop yeah. people spending a million dollars. You go, actually, there's a bumper in the way and the chances of two a, people being fraudulent are less. Yeah. And this is what's wild where this gets into be a bit of a paradox on portfolios where you start there. You had system based and then what was the other one you called it? So one is one is contextual and the other is contextual. Systematic. System. systematic means it applies to everything. So people start applying systematic solutions to contextual knowledge. And you see this a lot on long-standing big portfolios, five, six, eight, ten 10 years, where you hire people that are smart to go solve problems. And they think if mm-hmm. I just create a process, it will solve it. And then you have an overwhelming sort of process that isn't actually solving the contextual issue anymore. It's just bureau- bureaucracy. You know, it's just process on process on process. I, That's I the one that, agree. That, that you start could- seeing. And that's one where you almost want to just nuke the system, clear it all out, and then start over mm-hmm. from scratch. But no one wants to do that. Well, here's the thing that we can do today. So, for example, what I would do is as projects are going through, not at the end, as projects are going through, maybe once every month, I would pull all of the people into a room for five minutes each and interview them. What is one thing that happened that, you, that was a problem that you didn't see? What's something that went really well? That kind of thing. You can have AI transcribe all of that. You can put it through generative models. You can, you can say, summarize to me all the lessons learned this month. You can pull things that you think are systematic, which then go off for additional analysis because it's only systematic if every single project sees it. It's not systematic if only one or two see it. Um, or they're exposed to it. And then... You could, you and I know that you can easily create models where they can serve up contextual instruments. And the process, by the way, can be as simple as once a month, you need to ask this AI, is there any lessons that it can share with you based on the scope you're doing that month? That can be the process. It's as simple as that. And you just type in, yeah. I'm doing 
um, you know, welding. Are there any lessons learned that I should know? Yes, here are seven lessons that you need to know. Don't don't cool. let Greg and Mike ever have a welding machine. <laughs> one of them lost There's an eye. <laughs> the one rule or one other thing that I thought about was that when I coach my kids' soccer team uh, and football, if you will, for people listening around, the game where you kick the ball into the net. Don't want to offend yeah. anybody. When I'm coaching my uh, son's team and and in either side gets up a lot, the coach will say, hey, before you score a goal, you have to pass the ball two times. So that mm -hmm. way they just don't run down and score. And I'm wondering if you set up a rule that says for any sort of project specific check that you create. So for example, let's say you create um, a, like a, a, a performance against duration metric for your project and a report, right? If you create one of those, you also have to create, here's your second pass, how will this help the project downstream? And so either mm -hmm. you've built that metric so the project downstream can actually use it, because how many times have they someone built a metric or built something? And it's a single use. The next team comes in, it's like, how do I set this up? Oh, well, you just got to do this thing for like three months and you got to do a contract. So mm -hmm. I think that could be another thing that you just instill in the culture of your program make that second pass. Whatever you're creating on this project, if you create one, you have to then explain and define and improve that next project downstream. I think that could really get a culture of, hey, we're thinking about this as a portfolio, not as a project. You're right. What you'd have to be very careful of there is that um, the, the process that you impose to do that is very simple and repetitive. So you know, if you're essentially what I call that is the process of creation. So if you create something, when you've created it, you have to do a one minute video explaining what it is, why it's valuable and how you can use it later on. And it's just a, something as simple as that, because to embed that kind of large scale behavioral change, you need simple instruction like yeah. pass the ball twice. And yeah. you also need you also need some kind of police. Now, yeah. if, well, the, if the kids police, don't pass I would the ball say the twice, person, you go. Yeah, well, I'd say someone to catch the ball too. You know, like someone yeah. to like, and I think that you're, you're calling it police, but I mean, really what I just realized we're banging on the, like Toyota invented this 40 years ago with the Kaizen method, right? That's all we're explaining yeah, right yeah. now. <laughs> well, in new uh, terms. In, in, yeah, yeah, in, 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 plus in really minus. high level, in really high level terms. But what I, what I see is that, you know, coming, coming full circle, I think this is a fascinating topic because organizations have never had the cloud or AI before. So organizations yeah. have only had military governance, which is top-down, bureaucratic, enforced through sign-off yeah. processes. And that They've scales never had linearly, emergent governance. Right? Yeah. You know, that's, that's a linear scale. Like I, I have five processes. I need five people. You know, the more process you add, mm -hmm. the more the more people you add. One other thing that just came to my mind, I don't know why I'm so creative and uh, this morning on just the wild things is I'd almost want to look when people go through and map out their processes or do processes just to put some funny number to it that says like, hey, every time we create a process, it, it costs a dollar. You know, it's almost like, mm -hmm. it, and just to like set out how much it costs. So that way, when people go to create processes or systems, you have some sort of measuring of like, is this worth it? And my favorite one is stage gates. So if you go into any portfolio, oh, we got to have stage gates. We have to have stage gates. You know, like if we don't have this information, we're not going to go approve for it. And it's one of those ones where I feel like if you added up the dollars it's costing and the mm -hmm. value, like you just wouldn't do stage gates. Like there wouldn't actually be that robust of an approval process to go through with it. And I know that sounds controversial, but I think a lot of times, and maybe it's just because I'm used to dealing with more mature programs, that they do have that dollar value. And where, where I'm going with this is when, when you bring in AI, those dollars start to go down, you know, yep. like on the process side. But if you're not really kind of tracking where you're at overall in the dollars, I just feel like you there are situations where you may just end up taking this great technology and then just adding more bureaucracy to it. You know, like Well, I think I think this actually comes down to the flavor of management within each organization. And my my flavor, my personal flavor of management is that management is a productivity multiplier, whereas um, individual contribution is a productivity ad ad additional. 
So for example, if I have a team of five people and I, and they produce five units of work, I hire an individual contributor. I've got six units of work. If I hire a manager, they need to work on the, uh, the objectives, the people, the processes, the systematization and the tools plus integration with other departments to the tune of each person has to increase their productivity by 20%. Otherwise, I might as well just hire an individual contributor. Here's the wild and thing. Replace the word people with process. And I feel the exact same thing that we're talking about on portfolio side. Uh, you know? Yes. And actually, this is the med. It's just that normally people at that level are very, very senior. So there's less yeah. scrutiny to what they're doing. And But I will actually give a counter to something you just said around... Um, uh, around the stage gates. Um, a lot of the process in big organizations is incredibly inefficient 99% of the time, and then it's incredibly efficient for 1%, but the 1% yeah. it catches as a company ender. And yeah. it's there to stop the nuclear button happening. So, oh, for sure. It's there to stop someone signing a contract where they get paid a hundred million, but it's going to cost the business two billion. You know, in that situation, that might only happen once every ten years. If you think you know you're going to lose basically two billion on that, I'd rather have fifty million of people wasting their time than that risk. So exactly, but that's to a your totally point, fair point. You're you're completely correct in that. What AI and cloud essentially enable people to do now is they reduce the cost of governance by over a hundred times because it can be automated. And actually in the venture world, this is called gas. So, you know, you've got SaaS software as a service, gas is governance as a service. Yeah. It's huge. And this, I think, yeah, is it's super interesting. Yeah. 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 I, th I think it is. I, I actually yeah. think the future of project management is gas systems, uh, that actually help people. So it's like, hey, there's an approval process coming up. I've already pre-written all the documents for it. Can you just check them for me? It's not asking you, do you want to do the process? It's done it, and it's asking if you want to check. Like well, think about things. think about this hypothetical for a bit. You have a program that delivers multi-billion dollar projects. You have to think about how much review actually happens to like maintain a, a strong stage gate process. Now, I know the oil and gas folks out there, you know, they have a robust process on their side and it's been developed over hundreds of years. Totally get it. But you, the, even to maintain that, they have to be spending loads of money of people just reviewing other people's work. So when you say the gas systems, to me, that is. I drop my schedule into a folder. It's, it's already doing the checks. The approvals are happening offline, not in meetings, wasting people's times. And then people are going through it and checking it. And that, you know, kind of older school stage gate process is going away. And then you're getting optimizations out of it by being able to track some of the data that comes out of those, those gas processes. And that's, totally that to agree. me is where, you know, and, and I think for people, who are listening on the call who may be like, man, Greg and Micah are in that rocket ship flying around Mars right now. I all I got is pieces of paper and, and Primavera P6. If you start looking at, if you're part of a, a company, they are a portfolio of projects. Where can you find angles in to start helping out future projects? That is going to demonstrate immediate impact and be a boost to your career. And they're, they're easy to find. And whether you want to do it with a high-level technology solution or something that is a little bit more, uh, there's nothing wrong with not applying technology, just doing something standard. Mm -hmm. Definitely attack those angles that you see because you're just going to learn so much and then you're going to have some leadership opportunities tied to them. So I'd highly recommend people go explore some of these topics we, we brought up across this podcast. I agree. And I, I'd, I'd bring it round and say the conversation we've had today is the conversation that the SVPs have. So when, when you go into a room, fundamentally, you know, the, there's elements of forecasting and, and uh, uh, integrated business planning that they do, but a lot of it is uh, standards, people, processes, governance, which is reporting on standards and people, analytics, and systematization. 
because it's thinking, how do I take what a thing that works well and make it into many things that work very well? And, you know, just considering that is already advancing your thinking um, of scheduling and tactics. Completely agree. Well, I think we both slammed out those final thoughts pretty well. Shall we just <laughs> awkwardly hit the leave button and just disappear into the smoke like Batman? <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. Let's go. Well, hey, barbecue. folks, if, uh, no, if you like this portfolio discussion, we're happy to have more of them. If you're looking for other tips, tricks, and tactics, please just reach out to us. I mean, we're, we're here to help. We would love to shoot episodes or bring guests on to dive into the topics that you want to see. So if there's something that is just scratching at your brain that you'd love to hear about, feel free to reach out to us and we'll try and make that happen. So for us on Beyond Deadlines, hit the subscribe button, please do us a favor. I think I looked at like 60% of people who come and watch these videos aren't subscribers. So will you help us out and hit the subscribe button? We can just do so much more as this channel grows and we'd love to keep helping you out and supporting you on your planning and scheduling journeys. And with that, have a wonderful week and we'll see you on the next one.